Uh, we greet you this evening from Alabama, and uh, we, are, of course, are continuing our ongoing study, which we have titled Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. I think tonight you're going to find uh, this study particularly interesting um, as we continue to look at the issue of ghosts. I do have a couple of videos I want to share with you. Now, sometimes YouTube will cause a problem with the videos that I'm sharing. And sometimes they don't, so it's kind of hard to know which is one and what is which. I wish I better understood how all this stuff worked. We do not share them with the intent of making any money. If you notice, we do not monetize any of our videos. Uh, the gospel is to be offered for free. It is not to be profited from. Uh, you're not supposed to make money off of uh, preaching or teaching the Word of God. Uh, the Bible said the workman is worthy of his hire. That means that those who benefit and are blessed by a ministry ought to support it, not that you should monetize your videos so as to profit from them. So, the segments of videos that we share with you, we are not sharing um, with any intent whatsoever of making a dime. We do not monetize our videos at any time in any way. If for any reason you do not, um, you're not able to see the videos and you wind up, you know, um, unable to see them for whatever reason, please hang in there. Uh, when the video's over, we'll go back to live camera. And then when I share the high def video of today's Bible study, I will be editing in those videos um, again so that hopefully you can see them. And again, uh, occasionally we have an issue with either Facebook or YouTube, but usually like with YouTube, I'm able to um, communicate with them and let them know we're only sharing segments, we're not profiting, etc., etc., and then they clear it so that it's good for publication. But we're trying to share these videos. I have two segments I want to share with you today. Uh, they total, I think, about 15 minutes in total between the two. One is about 10, the other, actually, the other is not even a minute, so it's about 11 minutes in total. Um, so again, if you have any problem viewing for any reason, please hang in there. We will be back, okay, with the um, uh, with the actual video, okay? <sighs> we want to go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our Bible study this evening. So if you would bow your heads with me, King Jesus. Master, Savior, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, we come before you today, Lord, with the Word of God prepared to be broken for the feeding, the sustenance, the benefit of God's people. We ask, Lord, tonight that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would flow that you would quicken my mind as the teacher and allow me to articulate effectively to the people of God that information which you would have me to articulate. Allow every heart, every ear that hears to be prepared, not only to hear, but to receive from the word of the Lord today. For the word of God is our supreme authority. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Master, let the anointing flow tonight. Help those, Lord, who may be dealing with issues and they've come to this Bible study in an effort to receive the information that they need to achieve deliverance and victory for themselves, their children, their homes, Master, today let the anointing be like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. 
We ask all this in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Tonight, what I'm going to do is I am going to go over a number of points uh, that I simply have put under the umbrella of things to consider. There are any number of things that if you simply apply a little bit of reasoning, a little bit of thought uh, to these things, you can understand that what is often interpreted as ghosts cannot possibly be ghosts. What is attributed to spirit cannot possibly be spirit. Uh, so, we want to look at some things that need to be considered. We're going to look at what the Word of God has to say, because again, as Bible-believing Christians, the Word of God is our final authority in all matters. And we're going to look at what the Word of the Lord says. And I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. But as we begin today, what I would like us to do is first look at, um, I'm, I'm going to have us first look at a man telling his story as a child he had an experience. Now this man claims throughout his youth he saw spirits. And uh, But in this particular story, I, I think there's something interesting to be gleaned from this. I've told you before that spirits, uh, demon spirits, will manifest themselves as various people in various circumstances. And oftentimes uh, the circumstances are uh, deemed good. You know, we look at it and say, oh, but something good came out of this. And because something good came out of it, it must be good. And folks, that is, uh, the old adage goes that the ends justifies the means. Therefore, because the end is good, it justifies what has happened and makes what has happened appear to be good. However, Satan knows that saying, and he knows that if he can uh, do something in such a way so that the outcome can be translated and interpreted as good, uh, then immediately people are going to attribute the entire experience to being something of a good nature. However, we forget that the Word of God says that Satan himself is able to transform himself into an angel of light. So the very personification of wickedness and evil is able to present himself as an angel of God. So therefore, no, the, ends does, the end does not justify the means a good outcome, a positive outcome, just because it puts tears in your eyes or it brings a family member, quote-unquote, peace or comfort does not mean that uh, the experience itself was still not authored by demonic spirits. Absolutely. So let's watch this story real quick. Uh, this man is a hospice nurse been working as a hospice nurse for many years, and this is the story that he tells. We lived in a town, but all around us was uh, cornfields, cornfields and cows. That's what we were famous for out there. Um, my mom liked to go to this church in a nearby smaller community. Uh, she had friends there, so on Sunday mornings when we would drive to church, it would be like 10 or 15 miles through cows and corn, cows and corn, it's a small little farmhouse, and then cows and corn, until we got to this um, this tiny little church. That was wonderful. The people were so nice, and I made friends there. Um, one particularly, I was probably about 12 years old, and um, my friend Lee was probably around 16 years old, so 
he lived him going living in another uh, community than I did. I only got to see him on Sundays, and we would just hang out together, just have a really good time, go to Sunday school, and sit in church next to each other. And um, I always looked forward to seeing Lee. Well, one day we were going to church, and uh, my mom and dad are in the front seat. I'm in the back seat. We're driving uh, down this two-lane highway, uh, cornfields, cows, farmhouses, that's it, um, heading on the way to church. And way up ahead of the road, I saw somebody, somebody standing at the side of the road. And, you know, there's never anybody out there. So as we're getting closer and closer, it just looked familiar, but I... I, I, I couldn't quite see it, and as we got closer and closer and closer, there was my friend from church, Lee. And alongside the road, there would be a, a big ditch, and then like a little hill, and then it would go into cornfields. And that little hill kind of kept the water, we, we got a lot of rain there, it would keep the water from rushing into the, into the road. And Lee is standing on that little hill. So it's about four feet away from the road, and I bought a four feet higher than the road. And I'm coming up on, on him, and there's Lee, and I, I'm telling my dad, slow down, slow down. Here's Lee, here's Lee. Psh, we just drive right on by him. I said, there's Lee back there on the side of the road. He might need help. And my mom and dad said, well, we didn't see him, so on we go. And uh, I'm thinking, well, you know, he might need some help. Can we, can we stop? And, well, we didn't. He was wearing uh, a white dress shirt, um, black pants, uh, black slacks, and a black belt, and very nice shiny black shoes, like what he would have worn to church. And I thought, well, okay, okay. So we get to church, and I go to my uh, Sunday school class. Lee's not there. And after Sunday school, which is about an hour, then we join the whole congregation, and we have the church group. And I'm sitting with my mom and dad, and I can see Lee's parents sitting over there sobbing. And I'm thinking, you know, what's going on? And at the end of the church, um, a church meeting, the minister says, you know, let's all say a prayer for Lee. He's been missing for several days. And uh, I, my mom looked at me and she just said, don't say a word. And, um, you know, at the end of the service, um, everybody's walking out. Well, I run up to his parents and I say, I saw Lee on the side of the road. We drove right by him. I saw him clear as day. And I told my parents to stop and they wouldn't. Well, now they're mad. And they run up to my parents. Why didn't you stop and help our son? And they said, well, we didn't see him. We didn't see him. We're sorry. So on a way driving back home, Lee's parents are in their car and they're following our car. And uh, so we're driving back, and I'm hoping I can find Lee because there was like no road, there was like low um, uh, landmark. It was just, you know, cows and cars, uh, cows and corn, and um, every now and then a little farmhouse. And yeah, I hope I can find where he was standing. And we're driving on the way home, them following us, and up there in a the distance, there he is. He's in the same spot on the side of the road. Of course, now it's the other side of the street. We're heading the other way. And I'm telling my dad, slow down, slow down. There's Lee, there's Lee. We just drive right on by him again. I said, you passed him. And, you know, my parents said, well, we didn't see him. So they wouldn't slow down. So I opened the car door. I was going to jump out. And, of course, you know, they slow down. My dad's mad. And I say, yeah, I'm going to go show you where Lee is. So I jump out of the car. My dad pulls over. Lee and uh, Lee's parents, which were much older people, were in the car behind us, and they pull up behind my, my mom and my dad, and I'm running past them, and everybody's looking around because they're not seeing him. I see him clearly. And I had to run, because my dad went drives pretty fast, and finally get up to where Lee, um, Lee was standing. And Lee's parents are backing up slowly, trying to keep up with me and, and wondering what I'm seeing. My dad's running up the road, and so is my mom. And I approach the side of the road, looking at the field and looking up where Lee was standing, completely solid. And I'm saying, Lee, you're going to get in trouble. Here's your mom. They've been looking for you. They mentioned you in church that you've been missing. Um, here they come now, you know, come up with an excuse, you know, what happened. 
and he's not looking at me, he's not responding to me, he's just looking out at the horizon. So I would have been about, oh, I got goosebumps. I would be about four feet underneath him, and he's just, you know, not paying a bit of attention to me. And, um, you know, my dad comes up, and here's his old parents, and, and, I'm looking at Lee and say, Lee, here's your mom and dad. Say something to them. And they're looking at me like I'm nuts. They see absolutely nothing. And I was, I was a tiny little 12-year-old, and my dad was pretty tall. And when he was staying there, he could look down into the ditch between the road and this little uh, levee going into the cornfield. And it was all filled up with, with weeds. And they would trim the weeds like once a year. And this was, this was summer. So there was a lot of weeds there, and he saw something in the weeds. So my dad's getting down in the mud and the muck and the water sitting there and starting to pull something and move the weeds around. And as he moved the weeds around, I could see a handlebar of something, you know, a bike or something like that. Well, it ends up, we didn't know this, but against Lee's parents' wishes, he bought a motorcycle a couple days prior to that. So my dad... My dad... Is, now he's just down in the mud and it's just, you know, up to his calves and he's pulling and pulling the weeds and he's yanking on this handlebar and the bike. And he says, it's Lee. He's gone. And uh, the more he's pulling, the more, you know, trying to get free the motorcycle and his body out of the mud. And he's, I can barely see what's going because mud was just everywhere. And, and I could see him pulling something up and it was Lee's body. And, I mean, it was just a mess. Lee's mom passes out and falls on the road. And... Her husband's, you know, trying to get her up and revive her, and my mom's over there trying to help her up. And by then, cars are starting to stop and people running up to help. And my dad's just pulling and pulling and pulling. So I'm looking down at Lee's mom, you know, thinking, you know, should I, what should I do? I'm just a kid. And when I turn my eyes away from Lee and I'm looking down at his mom, I clearly heard him say very, very slowly, he said, I'm sorry, Mom. And I could hear it right now. <laughs> and I was looking at her, and they were lifting her up. And I said, Lee just says, I'm sorry, Mom. Well, you know, they're basket cases, and, you know, my mom's doing her best to help them, and, and Dad's pulling his body up and the, and the uh, motorcycle up, and all these people are coming and helping. And my parents have me get in the car and just go sit. So I was there for probably about an hour or so, and the police show up, and, uh, you know, uh, other people are taking care of the situation. And pretty soon my dad's trying to clean himself off, and we get in the car, and we go back home, and... And, of course, everybody's feeling bad. Um, we're sitting around the table, and we had some, you know, some supper and, and kept talking about it. And, and they kept asking, well, what did he look like? How did he sound? Um, my parents had seen spirits, too, and I had seen them as a child. So this is not an unusual topic for us to have talked about, but it was just interesting. They didn't see him, but, but I clearly saw him. And um, that night, you know, I'm, I'm up in my room and getting ready to, to go to bed. And there was a knock at the door. And it was law enforcement, I don't know, a police sheriff, something like that, um, came. There was a couple of them. And they wanted to talk to me. So my, and my folks called me down. And sure, you know, I'll tell you whatever I can tell you. And I went over what I saw. Well, they didn't believe it for a moment that I saw him. They thought I killed him. They thought I killed him, and that's how I knew where his body was. Uh, uh, they thought uh, there was a suggestion that I had ran him off the road. Well, I'm 12 years old. I had a rickety old bicycle, you know, and I lived in, the, in another community. How am I going to go all the way out there and 
run run my friend off the road and there's no landmarks like you know if i didn't see him standing there i never would have found that spot again um anyway and they came back another time and drilled me again and then uh, my parents put their foot down and they stopped them from talking to me and they did all the answered all the questions they would have me stay in my room and they buffered you know all the accusations um, his funeral Lee's funeral was a few days later I didn't go I don't remember if my parents went or not but the next week or the week after we went back to church and um, of course it was very sad and we get there, and people were, like, very rude to us. They were very um, quiet. Um, Lee's parents would glare at me. They wouldn't even look at my parents. And uh, the other people around wouldn't speak to us. So after churches were leaving, the minister called my parents to the side, and, and my folks had me go sit in the car again. And when they came out to the car, they said, this is the last time we're coming to church. So I don't know if words were said or if we were asked to leave, but we never returned to that church again. And what a shame, because my, you know, my mom had family and friends there. Um, this boy, he feels good, according to him, that this boy spirit uh, used him to convey this message to his parents. Well, I think it's rather stupid to think that you could call this a good outcome. If you're sharing something with the parents and the parents don't believe for one minute that what you're saying actually come from their son, then how in the world is this a good outcome, number one? Number two... He tells later in the video that I saw on YouTube, he tells later of the police coming to his home and they're questioning him. And the long and short of it is they suspect he had something to do with this young man going off the road, winding up in a ditch. They weren't sure if this kid didn't somehow run his friend off the road or something because the way they see it is there is no way in the universe this kid could have known where that body was unless he somehow had something to do with the accident. Well, of course, the kid says, you know, he lived miles and miles and miles down the road, um, you know, in another community. And he said, I only had a bike. That's the only transportation I had was a, a pedal bike. He said, how in the world am I going to wind up that many miles up the road? And why on earth would I run my friend off the road? Um, it just doesn't make any sense, you know. Finally, his parents intervene. They take over the conversation with the police because they realize their son is being accused and suspected of doing something. Uh, that next Sunday, they go to the church after the funeral has been taken place. And long story short, they're asked to leave the church because nobody there believes this kid's story. Uh, again, I was not going to share the entirety of the video as it would take far too long. But he goes on to explain in the entire video how that the whole community turned on him. He went back to school, he went through high school, and he was tormented every day by other students, by people in the community, because everybody believed that this kid had something to do with the accident that took his friend's life. He even then goes on to say that over the years when he would read a fam of um, school reunions and high school reunions, he said, I would never go because of the shadow that was over me related to this incident. Said finally, in like 2022 or something, he said that... Um, he had gotten notice about a 50th reunion for his class, and he decided, yeah, you know what, it's been 50 years, surely people aren't still holding all that mess against me and all that.
Uh, by the way, he and his family moved out of that community they had been in right after he graduated high school because of all the grief that was caused by this incident. And uh, they felt like it was for his betterment that they stay in that community until he graduated high school. He said, I don't know why they thought that, but, you know, they stayed there until I graduated, and then we moved. So anyhow, <coughs> uh, he winds up, frankly, being contacted and told that he is disinvited from the reunion. They don't want him there. And again, it all harkens back to this event. And he swears up and down that, you know, he saw the boy's spirit and so on and so forth. Folks, the ends, the end, I keep saying ends, the end does not justify the means. Even if this entire encounter, if this entire experience had generated a positive outcome, the bottom line is the very nature of what transpired, <coughs> excuse me, calls into question all that is taught in the Word of God. Uh, The fact that this boy's spirit, so-called, appeared to this young man uh, implies that after death, again, he does that your spirit does not return to God, that God does not make a decision as to what happens with your uh, spiritual man, that somehow, some way, you can get stuck or you can stay. And, you know, it's always so interesting, again, it's always so interesting because these so-called paranormal experts, if that boy's ghost, as it were, had shown up at their home, then they would have said, well, you know, he loved his family so much, and blah, blah, blah. If that boy's ghost had shown up at the school, then it would have been, well, he really loved school, and blah, blah, blah. Um, they always find a way to try to explain uh, the circumstances surrounding the appearance of a, quote, ghost. And uh, in this instance, of course, well, his spirit lingered around where he had died. So the spirit knew that his friend would see him. Uh, when his friend came by, he didn't look at his friend, he didn't address his friend, he didn't say a word to his friend, but he stayed there next to his body because he knew his friend was coming. See, there, there are too many. If you look at all the factors at play, there's too much contradiction. There are things that just don't really make sense. And uh, then on top of that, this whole experience wound up becoming the bane of this bearded man's existence for many, many, many decades. He became hated, despised, mistreated, abused by the community that he lived in. And I believe Satan laughs all the way to the bank, so to speak, because he has created all this confusion. He has created all this negativity and all this angst. And all he had to do in order to accomplish this was appear to one person and create suspicion. That's all he had to do. And if you look at this story and you look at all the details, to me, that's exactly what it looks like happened. The Spirit was there for the express purpose of causing this young man to be called into suspicion. He says, my parents saw spirits, you know, as well. I wasn't the only one who ever had uh, encounters with spirit. Why then did mom or dad not also see this boy? Why is it that only this young man at 12 years old saw this friend of his had one or the other of his parents who also claimed to have had similar experiences not just once or twice, but ongoing. If they also had seen, well, then they could have 
um, served as a witness, as it were, and said, I saw it too, you know, but they couldn't say that because they didn't see it. So this whole circumstance transpires and all it winds up doing is bringing a lot of negativity, a lot of angst, a lot of anger, a lot of hatred, a lot of abuse, a lot of nastiness. And so uh, there are many times when people have spiritual experiences, when they encounter uh, spiritual, uh, we don't believe they're ghosts, we don't believe they're the departed or the dead, but when they encounter what they perceive as a ghost, and they then go to their family, to their community, to their friends, and they report what they have seen, and they wind up being labeled crazy, they wind up being labeled out of their mind, they wind up uh, being labeled as having mental health issues, okay? Um, this, uh, there, I believe there are some instances uh, with people who wind up in mental institutions and in psychiatric wards and psychiatric hospitals. Uh, I believe that there are some instances when, in fact, those people have, in truth, experienced a genuine encounter with the demonic spirit presenting itself as something else. And... Um, and they can, they can be given information, they can be given details, they can see details, they can see props, I call it. You know, the clothing they're wearing, the jewelry they're wearing, the way they wear their hair, uh, or maybe the ghost is riding a horse, or maybe the ghost is wearing the uniform of a, a certain uh, era, you know, a certain war. These are all props to help create the illusion that this spiritual entity is, in fact, a deceased person. And, um, <clears throat> and I do believe that there are people, I know there was one story I told you earlier of uh, what they referred to as a haunting in Connecticut, in which a family had a son who was suffering with cancer, uh, they moved to a home in Connecticut to get him close from New York to get him closer to his treatments. And uh, he wound up beginning to have spiritual encounters. And then not only he, but his younger brother who slept in the same room with him, the both of them began to see things. And nobody believed either one of them. They felt that this sick boy was having delusions and that in effect uh, he was... Um, causing his brother to see things, you know, by, by claiming to see certain things. So, you know, um, it becomes the perfect storm. And I told you, the enemy uses the sick, the infirm, those who are under a great deal of stress, those who are under a great deal of pressure. When you hear uh, so-called psychics and paranormal experts talk about... Um, Poltergeists are what are referred to often as noisy ghosts when there's a lot of activity going on in the house that's very physical and very uh, active. And they say, oh, you know, this is caused because of some sort of uh, turmoil. And a lot of times this occurs um, with teenagers as they're going through uh, puberty and adolescence. Well, of course, adolescence is a very confusing and difficult time for every teenager, okay? So what does that do? That makes that period in their life a period in which the enemy can take advantage because it is a period of turmoil. They're trying to figure themselves out. They're trying to figure their bodies out. They're trying to figure their sexuality out. They're trying to um, determine who they are and who they want to be as a person. They experience a great deal of peer pressure and a lot of issues related to um, growing up, you know. And so, yes, adolescence and puberty and this period of time is a period of time that places a lot of young people in a very vulnerable place. And yes, the enemy is going to take advantage of that. 
Oh, but our paranormal experts say that uh, these so-called uh, poltergeists are just the manifestation. We create them ourselves. Our own emotions and our own turmoil, blah, 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 creates all this. Where do they get this stuff? What authority are they using? Where do they get this foolishness? Everything we're talking about, we have at least biblical support for. We know the enemy takes advantage of people in their weakness. We know that the enemy takes advantage of the young, the vulnerable, the sick, the wounded, the weak. Uh, those who have been separated from the pack. You know what I'm saying? We know what the Word of God says concerning these things. Therefore, from a biblical perspective, we can explain what is happening in the event of uh, poltergeist, for instance. From a, biblical, <laughs> from a biblical perspective, we can certainly explain the concept of poltergeist activity. Okay? So, I want to share one more thing with you. I'm, I'm hoping that this video will not have sound issues. I don't know. It's a very short clip. It's less than a minute, as I recall. And here is a famous television psychic by the name of Kim Russo. I believe um, you may know her from television. She has a program where she goes in and uh, works with celebrities who have had uh, ghost so-called experiences and she tries to figure out you know what caused this and she talks to their relatives and blah 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 and uh, and a lot of the information that she shares is most certainly accurate honestly it's kind of hard for me to say she may very well be working with a familiar spirit who is providing her with all this accurate information because they are able to do that. Or at the same time, I don't really know, to be honest with you, when I watch these shows, always in the back of my mind I'm thinking uh, a lot of this information may very well be available on the internet. You know, a lot of this information may very well be available if they do a little bit of research. And, uh, you know, Amy Allen on her show uh, that she did with this former police detective, you know, she always cracks me up because she'll give certain information. And then when Steve turns around and says, well, I found in my research that exactly what she said, blah, 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 is true. And then Amy Allen sits there and goes, really? Wow. Well, wait a minute. Lady, you're standing here claiming you're getting all this information from spirits. You're getting all this information firsthand from the ghost. Why on earth would you be the least bit amazed or surprised that the information that you've given is verified by research done by Steve Deshabi or whatever his name is? Why, why would that surprise you? What, but she does it every single show, every single time. And um, I, I, want you to, I want you to watch this clip. And again, I hope the sound works uh, of Kim Russo. And she's talking about so-called friendly ghosts, okay? Are there friendly ghosts? 4G is above 3G. It's not that far above us. People think like, oh, why are they there? Why are they stuck? Some of them asked for permission to stay close to their loved ones, to be very involved in their life and work through their loved one and guide them. It's not everyone's case though. There were some people that are just sent back or they can't quite put their foot in past a certain point in the astral realm or else they have to stay there. But yes, there are many friendly ghosts. Long story short, Kim Russo stands here and she's talking about, you know, oh, you know, 
um, the spirits are able to ask uh, permission to go back and to be involved in their families and to be involved with their loved ones and to stay around and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they just get stuck here and sometimes this and sometimes that. And oh, yes, there are friendly ghosts. Where is the authority? What authority does she use to offer this information? Yet there are millions of people who are people of, of no faith. There are some people who are people of faith who foolishly buy into what these so-called experts say. And yet, if you really contemplate what they're saying, where is the authority? What, what do they base all these claims on? What do they base all these theories on? Do they base it upon the information that they're given by spiritual beings? And therefore, you know, I'm getting my information directly from the other side. I was watching a video earlier today, <clears throat> a couple of them that involve cults and cult teaching. And one of the funny things about cults and cult teaching uh, without fail, a cult will demand that you not listen to any other source but them. They are the supreme authority. Whatever they say goes. So don't listen to anyone or anything else. Just listen to what uh, we tell you. And there are many people who have fallen into that trap when it comes to the spirit world, they're willing to believe what an invisible entity whom they have no way in the universe of verifying that this entity is who it claims to be or who it represents itself as being. There is no definitive way in the universe for these experts to verify that these people, well, yeah, there is, because they can ask them questions. Yeah, that would work if the only people who could possibly know the answers to these questions is the individual. However, if you're dealing with the demon spirit, let me tell you what the word of the Lord says concerning Satan. The word of God tells us that Satan was created with such wisdom and such insight that there is nothing, listen, there is nothing that is hid from him. He has access to virtually every ounce of information in the world. Anything he needs to know, he is able to know, okay? And demon spirits operate in unison with him. They operate as one. You know, when, when you watch the old um, Star Trek series, they used to have these characters that were referred to as the Borg. And the Borg were, you know, thousands of individual people who had gone through a procedure and it caused them to be tapped into a singular consciousness. This is the nature of the spirit world. Um, God's angels and uh, are spirits that serve him, and they are in unison with God, okay? The same is true on the other side of the equation. Satan and his angels created to serve and work with him are all united. They're tapped into a singular consciousness. This is why uh, even in scripture, oftentimes when a demon is cast out, they're cast out with the wording, I rebuke you, Satan. In Jesus name that's not to say that that specific spirit in that specific person is Satan himself no but he is part of the satanic 
network. And when you rebuke Satan, you rebuke every one of his spirits. When you rebuke any one of his spirits, you may rebuke it by simply using the name Satan, okay? And so, uh, how is it that these people think, you know, well, uh, oh, I saw an apparition, I saw an image, and it appeared as such. Okay, where is there an authority that is not based on uh, personal experiences and anecdotes? Where is an authority that tells us that spiritual beings are able to present, uh, for instance, oftentimes they say, well, you know, he appeared as solid as you and I. He appeared as much of a man as you and I. And, you know, it wasn't like they were just seeing an apparition or uh, some cloudy figure. You know, they saw an actual, what appeared to be flesh and blood, fully formed person. And we have all these paranormal experts, excuse me. Who will tell us that ghosts are able to do this. So what you're telling me then is that a ghost, the spirit of, a, of the dead, are able at will, apparently, if they happen to have enough energy or they have enough know-how, they're able to appear living once again. That's, that's what you're telling me. Um, when Jesus appeared before the 12th, uh, uh, the 11 remaining disciples after his resurrection, he specifically said to them, See, look, come feel me, touch me. I'm not spirit. Why? Because a spirit hath not flesh and blood. So, if you're seeing a figure that appears to have flesh and blood, and you can literally touch it, you can speak to it, you can actually interact with it, then my friend, according to the words of Jesus, a spirit hath not flesh and blood. So, the very fact that he appeared with flesh and blood in front of them was evidence that he had physically risen from the dead, that he had physically revived, as the Word of God declares, and was walking alive among them once again. So for a dead figure, a dead person to appear flesh and blood in front of you would imply that they had resurrected, even if only for a brief moment in time. Now, from a biblical Christian perspective, we understand, according to Scripture, that spiritual beings, especially on the negative side of the equation, on both sides, but on the negative side, most absolutely can take on a human form, human appearance, human attributes, right down to the ability, listen to me, folks, to engage in sexual intercourse and produce children. You say, well, brother, where on earth do you get that from? <coughs> Read the story of Noah. Read what the world had come to prior to the Lord's decision to destroy it by water by flood. The Word of God said that the sons of men began to interact with the daughters of men, that Adam's descendants, female, were now interacting with demonic spirits, and that offspring were literally created by this. This is why God chose to destroy the world by flood, because he had to annihilate this hybrid offspring born of spiritual beings and natural women. He had to annihilate this entire uh, race of people. Yet we have people, the Word of God said, that many 
of the men of renown, many of the stories we've heard of giants and people of extraordinary strength and extraordinary size and what have you, says many of them were actually the byproduct of these unholy unions. Now, have we not had um, excavations where they've turned up skeletons of abnormally enormous people, very, very large people? How many stories in antiquity that we for thousands of years perhaps have believed were just pure fiction? How many of those stories, in fact, Hercules, for instance, how many of those stories may have had some basis in truth, okay? So, there are any th number of things to consider now when we are looking at so-called ghosts. I ask the question, why do ghosts or the spirits of uh, passed on human beings, for instance, wear clothing? jewelry, shoes, etc. Do these items, does clothing, shoes, do these items also have a spirit or an energy that travels with us into the spirit world? Why do spirits often appear with props, tackle, animals, other items which help to identify them as being from a certain area, a period a time, or an experience. In other words, World War II, the Civil War, etc. Or Custer's Last Stand, for instance. Okay? The Word of God tells us quite plainly in Job chapter 121, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked, naked, naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In 1 Timothy 6, 7, the word of the Lord reads, For we brought nothing into this world, listen, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Word of God talks about uh, angels. It speaks of angelic spirits as being uh, in robes. The only garments that we ever read about in Scripture is robes. We read about the redeemed in the book of Revelation appearing in God's glorious heaven wearing robes. So therefore, why in the world would a spirit be wearing clothing that it possessed and that it had in this life? How is that possible? How do you bring clothing, as it were, with you into the afterlife? Then these wonderful experts who know everything will present this brilliant theory. Well, you know, they have the power to appear however they wish to appear. They have the ability to manifest themselves however they choose to manifest themselves. And again, I ask the question, um, upon what authority, what authority do we have that tells us that after death, man becomes Harry Potter? Where do we learn that after death, um, all of a sudden, human beings become uh, Samantha Stevens, and you know, with the twinkle of a nose, they're able to produce whatever they want to produce. They're able to create whatever they want to create. All of a sudden, human beings have an immense, amazing amount of magical powers after death, according to these so-called paranormal experts. However, from a biblical Christian perspective, we know that human beings do not possess such powers after death. However, there are entities in the spirit realm that can do this. They are called angels and they are called demons. Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister 
on behalf of the children of God, to do God's will and to benefit the children of God. Demons are sent out to deceive and to draw human beings away from any knowledge of the living God. They, Their whole purpose is to draw you away from a knowledge of God. Their, their purpose is to try to lure you as far in the opposite direction as they possibly can. Now, demons were able to present themselves as men in uh, pre-Noah, pre-flood days, and they were actually able to physically engage in sexual intercourse. We've heard You've heard stories of people who claim to have experienced sexual contact with spiritual entities. And um, this is a rather common theme sometimes, too. Again, from a biblical perspective, is this possible? Absolutely. The secular folks want to give us all kinds of theories. Well, you know, uh, he was a pervert in his real life, and he's a pervert after death. He was a rapist in his real life, and he is a rapist after death. Um, great. So all the evils in the world uh, that have existed down through time and memoriam can continue to visit their conduct upon the living, even after they're dead, in a spiritual form. And yet, again, you have to contemplate, how is it possible that a spirit that is invisible, that is unseen, is somehow able yet to perform a physical act, such as intercourse? How is that possible? The truth is demons appear in full wardrobe so as to, to represent someone from a specific time period or era. Without the clothing, it would be impossible to represent themselves as anyone in particular as clothing makes the man. Just like putting on a play, props and wardrobe are essential to the character being portrayed. Many people claim to hear noises which are directly associated with certain types of shoes. You know, I've heard people say, oh, I heard heavy boots, or I heard hard sole shoes, or I heard uh, what sounded like high heels, you know. They actually claim they're hearing sounds directly related to specific types of clothing. Or they'll say they hear footsteps, they hear walking, they hear dragging. But how is this possible? Do shoes also have a spiritual existence? Why would a human spirit run around in work-related costumes, uniforms, or gear? They weren't buried with those articles. You will notice that psychics and mediums often refer to what they claim a spirit is wearing in an effort to help identify or qualify the spirit they claim to be seeing. But they often describe an outfit or uniform that the deceased was not buried with. How did they attain such a wardrobe in the afterlife? Naked I came in, and naked I will leave. Question number two, how can a spirit inflict physical damage or injury to anyone in the natural world? Again, Jesus said in Luke 24, 39, after his resurrection, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Okay? Many people report having been bitten or scratched by spiritual entities. They also claim to hear noises that are directly associated with a natural 
flesh and blood existence, such as sneezing, crying, moaning, screaming. A spirit would not have flesh or bone. How then is it possible to inflict bites or to scratch? Why would a spirit who cannot be sick or ill, because you have to have a physical body to be sick or ill, how is it that a spirit who cannot be sick or ill cough or sneeze or what have you? A demonic spirit is an entity with a very real physical presence. Although it is not physical in our natural sense of the word. When a demonic spirit is present, people can often feel their presence as they do genuinely have a physical presence, albeit it is more like steam or the wind than it is a solid object. They do affect their environment in some way, however small. Another question I ask is, how can spirits engage in sexual, lewd, or intimate conduct? The Bible says, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Matthew 22, verse 30. In Mark chapter 12, 25, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Now, let's go down to verse uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. This is uh, leading up to the flood. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God, remember we told you, all spiritual beings that are not God are referred to as sons of God, all, okay? They are creations of God, that is angels and that is demons, that includes Satan. In the book of Job, when the sons of God, the angels and demons, came and presented themselves before the Lord, the word of God said, Satan came also and presented himself to the Lord, because he too falls under the umbrella of the, a son of God. Mind you, the scripture said Jesus is the only begotten son of God meaning he is the only human being ever born of God, therefore begotten of God, God alone being his father. So, um, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Again, that's Genesis 6, 1 through 5. So we see demon spirits interacting with human women. The truth today is a human spirit would have no interest in sexuality or intimacy. They certainly would not carry over their violent sexual history into the spirit realm, and even if they did, they would not be able to engage in any kind of sexual activity after death, as according to Scripture, 
as the spiritual man, we are asexual. Okay? Demon spirits will engage in sexual or lewd conduct at times. This is a form of abuse and manipulation having its basis in violence. Such spiritual conduct should never be tolerated, permitted, or certainly welcomed. Let's ask the fourth question. Why would a spirit eat or drink when neither activity is necessary for survival in a spiritual state of existence? I've seen stories on online. Cracks me up. I'm telling you, folks, all you got to do is use a little bit of thought. Use a little bit of common sense reasoning. It's not hard. Oh, you know, I had cookies on the counter and I came in the next morning and the cookies had been eaten. Yeah, and the ghost ate your cookies. Why? Eating is necessary to sustaining human life. Eating is necessary to sustaining the human body or any animal body for that matter. How is it that a spirit then a ghost, a human ghost, has any need or ability to eat. You would need a mouth, you would need a stomach, you would need to be able to digest, you would have to have taste buds. All of those things are part and parcel of a flesh and blood existence. So how in the world do we keep ascribing to something that is invisible, that is unseen, and we keep ascribing to that attributes that are part and parcel of a flesh and blood human existence. How do you do that, folks? How does that work? I don't quite understand how that all works. The Bible says, again, we're looking at the Lord after his resurrection. Uh, Luke chapter 23, 33 through 42 and they arose up, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. If you'd have felt the Lord's hand, where, what part of the body is the easiest part of the body to detect bones? Your thigh? Your stomach? No. Hands and feet. You want, you want to know if I'm just mush, if I'm just appearing to you as jello? Feel my hands. Feel my feet. You can easily see that I am what? Flesh and blood. That's what the Lord was saying. He wasn't referring to uh, marks in his hands or marks in his feet. He was referring to the simple fact, if you want to test and see that I'm in fact flesh and blood, come here. Feel my hands. Feel my feet. Check me out. See for yourself. He goes on to say, uh, verse 40, And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. So again, again, the Lord is using 
eating and drinking as evidence of his physical resurrection. He's saying, these are not things that a spirit can do. So let me show you that I am in fact alive again. Let me show you that I am walking among you once again as a man, not as the spirit being. He couldn't be what the Jehovah's Witnesses claim, that God gave him a spiritual body. No, that can't be possible because the Lord himself said, feel and see, feel, look at my hands, look at my feet, feel and see that I'm flesh and blood, flesh and blood, flesh and blood. Not a spiritual being not a spiritual resurrection, flesh and blood. And then he further goes on to validate his resurrection, suggesting to them, give me, you got meat, you got food, give me something to eat. And I'll eat it right here in front of you. And I'll prove to you definitively that I am not spirit. Folks, why would a spirit eat or drink? No need. The truth is that as evidence of his actual physical bodily resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ ate food in front of his disciples who fearfully thought they were seeing a ghost. A human spirit would have no need of food or water. Any manifestation that would suggest such activities as eating or drinking should immediately be interpreted as suspicious and unwelcome. People who say, well, Oreo cookies were my grandma's favorite food. See, the Spirit's using that as a way of trying to uh, support the notion that it is this person it's presenting as. It knows grandma's favorite food was Oreos. So if it appears as though Oreos have been eaten, we immediately put two and two together and say, well, it must be grandma. The only thing we don't contemplate is why in the world would grandma be interested in eating anything as a spiritual being? She doesn't have to eat anything, certainly nothing in the natural realm in order to sustain life. So what how is that possible? Why is that necessary? People who then, you know, uh, suggest, well, this, this was my grandma's favorite food. They wind up opening the door to demonic activity by validating the spirit's assumed identity because of the evidence, so-called, of this particular foods being eaten or disappearing. Fifth question I want to ask today, things to consider. How can a spirit emit noises, sounds, smells, or voices? If one does not possess a physical body, how then is it possible to emit sounds which require physical organs to produce, such as the voice box. That's just the good, you know, or it broke, I heard something break wind, or I heard something belch, or I heard something sneeze, or I heard something go. How, how is this possible? The truth is, spirits would not, spirits would not wear perfumes, they would not generate sweat or body odors, including expelling gas, if I may be blunt. A spirit does not require food or water. Why in the world would a spirit generate or emit smells or sensations which are directly associated with physical bodily functions? In other words, if it's coughing, a flesh and blood creature has to have something physically causing the cough. So if a spirit, if you hear a cough, then that means that somehow, some way, this spirit that does not have a body has got something somehow causing it to have to cough. No, 
the spirits using these noises. They're using these things as props. This is all part of their play. Well, I heard that the man who died in my house died of lung cancer, and he really had a heart cough before he died. And bless God, I was sitting in my bed, and I heard... <laughs> How is that possible? There's no, there's no, there's no physical uh, body that can be affected in such a way so as to necessitate that cough. Then we have these other brilliant so-called uh, experts in the paranormal realm. Well, you know, it's energy. This is just a recurrence. What it is, is it's this energy is just playing itself out over and over again. And sir, coughing, coughing. Friend, there wouldn't be a house in America, there wouldn't be a house in the world that you were not having some kind of a, quote, residual noise, smell, something that you're experiencing. If simple activity, human activity, natural activity in the natural world, if somehow natural activity can be captured in a space and just keep repeating itself and playing itself over and over, that makes about as much sense as nothing. How in the world is that at all possible? And if it were possible, why is it that every home in America, every home in the world, doesn't have some residual something going on? Because according to these people, even uh, uh, the physical act of coughing can become a residual occurrence, which we experience in here in our home. The truth is, okay, uh, spirits do not wear perfume. They don't generate sweat or body odors. They certainly do not have a physical body so that they would be able to smoke cigars or smoke cigarettes or smoke a pipe. And yet we have people saying, oh, you know, I smelled pipe smoke. Again, it is a prop. This spirit is using that. Well, I heard that the ship's captain who used to who built this house for his wife used to smoke a pipe and all of a sudden you're smelling a pipe and that offers some validation that the entity there is captain so and so no it does not it is a prop captain so and so being dead is either in heaven or hell uh, Captain so-and-so being dead, even if he were floating around, would be spiritual. And as a spirit, he would have no way in the universe of, of even possessing. Because you can't bring anything into this world when you come and you leave naked as well. Naked, meaning absolutely nothing. Nothing. You don't get props. You don't get to carry a box of Cubans out with you as you leave this life. So now you're saying, oh, well, there are cigars in the spirit realm. There are cigars. And how then does smoking a cigar in the spirit realm translate to being smelled in the natural realm? How do you get that crossover? No, these spirits are purposely creating these sensory experiences in order to try to convince you that they are the individual they are representing themselves as being. But from a biblical Christian perspective, we know better. Okay? Such manifestations are only used to help a spirit impersonate or appear to be a specific individual who is associated with such smells or sensations. Even demons will generally speak through 
a physical host. A human spirit would have no physical means whereby to produce vocalizations. Number six, why would a human spirit seek to scare or inspire fear in an individual to whom they are manifesting themselves? Does God use such human spirits to communicate his messages or to serve his purposes? The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. In first, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the word of the Lord declares, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Every single example, folks, to show you what is from God and what is not from God. Every example of, a, of an angelic spirit appearing to a human being in the Word of God is generally accompanied with the greeting, Do not be afraid or fear not. The first thing that an angel will say, because there is that natural uh, tendency in, on the part of human beings to be afraid of something, especially something that suddenly appears that we're not expecting and something that we can't altogether explain. But the first words out of anything that represents God is going to be, do not be afraid, do not fear. God does not operate through the spirit of fear. God does not use fear. Satan does. The spirit of fear is a very real spirit. I'm going to tell you right now. I've known many people who have been possessed of a spirit of fear, who literally have come into possession of a spirit of fear. Um, Many years ago, I was doing my internship in a church of God out of West Haven, Connecticut. And uh, the pastor, Brother Douglas Carver, marvelous man of God that I adored, uh, thought very highly of. He's gone on to his reward, but uh, Brother Carver had brought a man in to um, uh, present a presentation on rock and roll music and the demonic influences that exist within rock and roll music. Now, mind you, when I did my internship, I was like uh, 18. And when I was 16, I had dated a girl, uh, Barbara, who I'm still friends with today on Facebook. I'm actually connected to Barbara. And uh, she's married and has kids and all that. But she and I have remained friends all these years. She was my first serious girlfriend attempt when I was a teenager. I was 15, 16. And anyhow, um, I was at her house with her one day. And her mother asked uh, Barbara and I if we would go to the store for her. And what she would do is we used to cut through the woods because she lived on a dead-end street. And in Connecticut, it's very, very wooded. 70% of the state is uh, <coughs> undeveloped land. <coughs> so there's a lot of forestry, a lot of woods there. Excuse me. See, for me to cough and for me to have that reaction, I have to have physical uh, things happening in my body to generate that, okay? So how could I do this if I didn't have a body? Anyway, uh, so Barbara's mother had asked us if we'd run to the store. Well, because she lived up on this dead end, at the end of this dead end, 
uh, there were uh, woods and we could cut through a path through the woods and come out on another street, walk up to the store and come back the same way that we came. And she said to Barbara, if you see your brother Billy, because he was out with friends and they were probably in the woods. Hey, there was an area out there with some big rocks and everybody would hang out, the kids would hang out there. I won't tell you what all they'd be doing, but sometimes they weren't doing such good things. And uh, smoking pot and, you know, whatever. So if you see your brother Billy, tell him thus and so. I want to see him something to that effect. So we're cutting through the woods to go to the store. We see her brother Billy and some of his friends, and they're playing a boombox out in the woods, and they've got this real hard, heavy metal rock and roll crapola playing on the boombox. And she said, oh, wait a minute, Mom told me to tell Billy such and so. So she and I started to walk over toward where these kids were congregated listening to this real hard, heavy metal rock and roll stuff. All of a sudden, that boombox began to emit a sound that I kid you not, folks, I wish I could describe it. The only way I know how to describe it, it literally sounds like the voices or the sounds that come out of like a lion or a bear. Like this, you know, and it sounded... Loud as all murder, and it sounded violent, and it 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 literally sounded like there was a lion and a bear like fighting each other. You could literally hear almost like there was more than one uh, voice. There was more than one source. And Billy jumped up and he hit the boombox on the stop button because he was playing, if I remember correctly, he was playing a cassette tape. This, for you kids that are too young to remember, all you know was CDs and all. Well, this is back in the cassette days. He was playing and he hit the button. And he said, my God, what on earth was that? You know, I knew what it was. I knew, as I knew, I said, my God, that music is literally infused with demonic power. There are demons that are literally operating through that music. And as I drew close, a young man called to preach full of the Holy Ghost, that demon decided it was going to manifest itself, and it did. He tried to turn it back on, and it continued to make this noise. Turned it off again. Barbara told him quickly what she needed to tell him, and we jumped up out of there, got out of there, went to the store, came back, did our thing. I don't think it was more than a few months later, I was at home in my parents' house, and my brother Michael, when he was young, he was not a church person or anything, and uh, wasn't all that interested in God and the things of God, and he used to love to listen to that same kind of music, that same stuff. And one day, Michael was in the bedroom, and he was listening to that uh, type of music. And I happened to walk into the bedroom. I wanted to say something to him. And his boombox did the identical same thing. Michael about jumped out of his skin, because I'm telling you, the sound that comes out is so... It's terrifying. It's, it sends a chill through you like you can't even believe. I can't even describe it. it. I don't mean it scares you. I mean it terrifies you. It is a horrible, horrible, terrifying sound. And my brother did the same thing. He turned it off. Oh, my God, what was that? What was that? And then he tried to turn it back on again, and it did the same thing. The only day he turned it off, he took that tape out. He said, I'm throwing this thing away. He said, I don't like that. I'm throwing this thing away. I don't even know what that is. Scared him out of his mind. He remembers that to this day. Well, years later, a couple of years later, I'm 18. I'm doing my internship, and this man, Joe Vieira, comes in to do a program on rock and roll music and the demonic influences in certain types of rock and roll music and
what have you. And he did presentations on backmasking. You might remember that, where you play a record backward and you'd hear it actually say certain things when you'd play the record backward. And so my mother had offered for Joe, I don't know why, because we never did such things, but she had offered for Joe to stay at our house while he was in town to do this uh, presentation. We never, uh, I think maybe she did it because she thought he'd be able to talk to my brother Michael because Michael wasn't keen on going to church and stuff, you know. I think my, maybe that was her logic, I don't know, but anyway. So Joe was staying at our house and everything for a couple of days while he was in town to do this program. And I was talking to him at one point and I told him, I said, Joe, let me tell you what happened to me on two different occasions when people I knew were playing this really hard, like heavy metal rock and roll and stuff. And I think, I think Michael told me later it was either Black Sabbath or uh, Black Sabbath. I can't remember the name of the group. Uh, it was either Black Sabbath or another similar group. Anyway, and um, I told Joe what had happened. Well, later we were going to the church because the program was each night for like two or three nights. And later I went with him to the church to get set up and to get ready for uh, the program that evening that he was going to be doing. And uh, Joe's up there, you know, he's got all this sound equipment and all this. You know, he was a lighting and sound expert. He actually worked in the music industry as a lighting and sound guy. And when bands would come into certain areas, what they do is they hire people like him to go into the uh, auditoriums that they're performing in and set up their sound equipment and set up everything and you know they're experts so they get it all set up and Joe physically personally witnessed things that he talked about during his program during concerts that would blow your mind he's he saw people literally scratching themselves screaming that something was on them something was crawling on them and he said their arms were bleeding because they were scratching and not <laughs> not one or two people dozens of people claiming this as the band was up there singing and he saw some of these bands praying before their performances literally to Satan and asking him to use them and allow them to be a vessel for his purposes all right just trying to give you an idea of who this guy Joe was so Joe's up there setting up for the program for that evening and he said, Chuck, I want to play something for you. I said, oh, okay. He said, just listen to this for a minute. And he starts playing this, this recording. And I'm listening. And I'm just kind of in the background. I'm hearing faint, kind of low. And you can tell it sounds like a Catholic priest doing some kind of a thing in Latin, you know. All of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, you hear that exact sound that I heard come out of two different boomboxes on two different occasions. Exact same sound. And when it happened, I was sitting with my hands on the pew like this. And when that sound, I literally, my hands grabbed the wood on that pew. It, that's what it does to you. It literally, the sound is so horrifying. It just makes you like cringe like you can't believe and tighten up. And I grabbed that pew like that and I just, and he turned it off and he said, is that the sound you heard coming out of those boom boxes you were talking about? And I said, Joe, that is the exact sound. That is exactly what I heard. I said, that, that's not close. That is exactly what I heard. And he said, that is a recording that an Irish priest made in Ireland as he was trying to exorcise demons from, I think it was a 10 or 12-year-old boy. And he said... And that sound came out of the boy's mouth. 
And he said, and they, uh, I forget how they supposedly came to know this. He said, but they determined that it was a spirit of fear manifesting itself. Well, that made perfect sense because that spirit of fear, man, it that sound, I'm telling you, if you heard those that voice, it it'll terrify the fire. I don't care who you are. I don't care how uh, gung-ho you are. I don't care how much you think that such things would not affect you. That voice is so horrifying, so terrible sounding. It, it's otherworldly. It doesn't even sound like anything you'd hear. In the, like I said, it almost sounds like a bear and a lion coming at each other. But at the same time, they're trying to speak. And you literally hear the fluctuations as though it's articulating, you know. And, and I hate to try to imitate it, but, you know, it's kind of like, and you're hearing all this articulation like it's trying to speak it's trying to say something but it's and the voices are so deep and so guttural guttural that i mean they sound like they're coming from hell itself it's a terrifying sound the bottom line is this god hath not given us the spirit of fear. Anything that generates fear. Now, some of these foolish so-called experts on television say, oh, well, it doesn't mean to scare you. It, it was just trying to let you know it's here. That's why it's pushed you down the stairs. That's why it tripped you. That's why it scratched you. That's why it hurt you below me. That's stupidity. Oh, it's not trying to cause you fear. It's not trying to make you afraid. Um, if it weren't trying to make you afraid, it would know better than to do these stupid things, okay? God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Anything that generates, anything that inspires fear is not of God, period. End of the story. So therefore, uh, no spirit that is of God is going to scare you or inspire fear in you. That is not how God operates. So that's where we're going to have to end uh, this week's study. Uh, as I've said, the angels begin every time they appear. They say, fear not, do not be afraid. And when an angel speaks, it's like God in essence speaking. It's not merely them saying to you, don't be afraid. But what they're literally doing is they're speaking peace to the situation. When an angel says, fear not, the fear dissipates. The fear goes away. Okay? They're literally speaking that fear out of existence at that moment in time. All right, folks, that is as far as I've been able to get uh, this week. Next week, we will pick up here. We still have a few more points that we want to look at and uh, just what I call things to consider. And we will continue with this next week, okay? Keep me in prayer if you would. I've been invited to participate in a, a three-day conference in uh, Kentucky. There is an LGBT affirming church in Kentucky that is uh, going to have a three-day conference next month, about this time next month. And uh, no, I'm sorry, no, it's the weekend of the 4th, I think, the 4th of July weekend, now that I think about it. So keep me in prayer. Uh, I'm going to be doing a two-hour class on uh, LGBT affirming theology. Obviously, it's going to be a real quick run through. I won't be able to go into a whole lot of detail, but we have our series on YouTube that people can go to and watch if they want to see uh, much more detail and see it broken down much more clearly. But do keep me in prayer. I want the Lord to use me. 
I want people to be able to come to a brand new revelation and understanding of the grace of God and salvation without works. Amen. All right, we want to go to the Lord in prayer tonight as we close this session. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the presence of God. We thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord. We thank you for the truth of God. For, Lord, you declared in this life that you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I pray to God, Lord, tonight that those who are watching, who may have thought, who may have believed falsely that something they have experienced or been experiencing is a human spirit, you know, causing some disruption or some difficulty in their life. And I pray, God, tonight that their eyes might be open and they might understand so that they might know exactly what it is they are, in fact, dealing with and understanding what they're dealing with, that they might also understand that you have given us the tools to come out victorious through the name of Jesus Christ, by the power and presence of the Holy Ghost. And Master, you've given your church, your people, believers, authority over every unclean spirit and every foul thing. And I pray, God, right now by the Holy Ghost, that you would empower every believer. Let the authority of God begin to surge through their veins. And let them at this moment understand they have the ability to take authority in the name of Jesus. And through the name of Jesus, they can command every unclean spirit to, to depart. Master, we love you. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for our time together. And we ask God that you would keep us safe in your care. Until the next appointed time when we as the people of God come together to lift up your name, to celebrate your word. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I appreciate your being with us today. I hope that this study is a blessing to you and that you're learning something Sorry about that. Did it again. I hope that you're learning something and that this information is proving valuable to you. I hope you'll be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for our broadcasted uh, live uh, celebration of life in Christ Jesus from here in Alabama. And then, of course, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, join us as we continue our study, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. Until we meet again, as always, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer. <laughs>